portfolio questions. And the first question is Tom Arthur, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I remind the Chamber that I am a member of the Musicians' Union and a co-chair of the Collective Learning Partnership Group within the Parliament to ask the Scottish Government how it supports trade unions to deliver skills training and lifelong learning. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Trade unions play a key role in supporting the learning needs of workers. That's why in 2019-20 we're maintaining £2.262 million to Scottish Union Learning to support workforce development and £100,000 for their Fair Work Leadership and Equalities programme. Scottish Union Learning are also using £85,000 provided over 2017 to 2019 from Scotland's allocation of the National Cyber Security Programme Fund to build the cyber resilience capacity of unions. Tom Arthur. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and the Government's continued commitment to Scottish Union Learning. Given that the quickening pace of change in the world of work, driven by increasing automation and greater adoption of artificial intelligence technologies, could mean that those entering the labour market today may be employed in a range of different and varied jobs over their working lives. Does the Minister agree that trade unions can play a valuable role in ensuring that Scotland's workforce is supported in skills development through what has been characterised by some as the coming fourth industrial revolution. Minister. Well, in respect of uh, that last uh, point, uh, this uh, area has to be uh, an increased focus of our activity, a major area of our activity uh, in relation to the wider skills uh, system. We need to make sure that we are uh, well placed to respond to the challenges and indeed the opportunities that automation uh, presents. Uh, our first, uh, future skills action plan will publish uh, shortly. Our, and the work we're taking forward in the National Retraining Partnership will feed into that more widely. But one of the things we were discussing recently at the Strategic Labour Market Group that I chair is that actually where we have more cohesive uh, labour markets, where we have good industrial relations, the workforce is actually less fearful of the impact of automation as well. So trade unions are hugely important in this agenda, and indeed the Scottish Union Learning uh, Initiative is uh, important as well. Are there members in the chamber, weren't there, when I said that the clocks are running at real time, but actually I've got a clock here that's telling me exactly the time that people are taking. So, again, be succinct with your questions and answers as we go on. It's something to do with stage three continuing. Don't ask me what it means. I don't understand it. I really think it's ridiculous, but there we go. A question to Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many eco-schools there are in the Stirling Council area. Cabinet Secretary. There are currently 27 eco-schools within the Stirling Council area. Bruce Crawford. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is the younger generations who are going to suffer most from the effects of climate change, particularly if we allow our planet to continue to be harmed in the way it has been? Therefore, can the Minister tell me what more can schools can do to educate young people about the importance of protecting our delicately balanced natural environment? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the nature of curriculum for excellence is that it relies heavily on the concept of interdisciplinary learning. So understanding climate change encompasses, uh, through the broad general education, understanding of science, about the uh, life in the outdoors, about the use of resources, about the science behind all of the questions of use of resources. So there's a broad opportunities for that to be the case. This morning I launched the uh, Learning for Sustainability Action Plan, which reinforces many of these concepts and I was delighted by the cross-sectoral endorsement that we've had for this work, and it provides a great opportunity for schools to take forward the vital work that uh, eco-schools have taken forward throughout many schools in Scotland, uh, which creates uh, the very clear aspirations within young people in our society for urgent action to tackle climate change, which this government is determined to do. Thank you. Question three, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update regarding the status of the new school, Butterstone. Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, the proprietor of the new school, Butterstone, which provided education and care for 24 learners, closed the school on the 23rd of November 2018. The priority of the local authorities was then to ensure that a long-term solution was in place for every young person. Every family was offered support and education by the local authority, including alternative places or interim provision. Moorhouse, who operated another independent school, have successfully registered an independent day school on the same site as the former new school of Butterston. As a result, Butterston House School was registered on the 9th of May 2019 and opened its doors to 13 students for secondary school provision on the 13th of May. 11 of these pupils previously attended the new school Butterston. Mark Ruskell. 
Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response, but he'll be aware, of course, that many families are still looking for answers, particularly about why their children didn't receive education for over six months in some cases. So will the government commit to supporting an independent inquiry into the actions of Perth and Kinross Council, the Care Inspectorate and Education Scotland's actions in inspecting, reporting and advising on the closure of the new school? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, that, that is an issue to which I am now giving consideration. Um, I indicated to families that my priority was to ensure that young people had continuity of education. And as I've said in my earlier answer, um, every effort was made to make sure that could be taken place. But I acknowledge that that is difficult for um, a number of the young people involved because of the very specific nature of the education they received at the new school, Butterson. So I'm giving consideration to that point. Uh, but what I would highlight to um, Mr Ruskell and to the Chamber is that the priority has always been to make sure that young people are educated in a safe environment, um, an appropriate educational environment. The inspectorates have particular statutory functions to exercise in that respect. And at no stage did any of the inspectorate, either the Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Education or the Care Commission, require the closure of the new school, Butterston, and I'm very happy to put that point on the parliamentary record today. Liz Smith. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. You've been very helpful, if I may say so, over the uh, new school issue. It has, as you know, raised questions about uh, the availability of places within special schools, uh, and particularly whether all the places that are available are um, being taken up. So could I ask what the Scottish Government uh, is doing to have discussions with local authorities to ensure that there is a, an awareness of how many places are available at any one time and whether they are actually being taken up? Secretary. There are a number of points in, in that very legitimate question because Liz Smith will appreciate that there is a fine judgment to be arrived at as to the appropriateness of mainstream educational provision for all young people and if mainstream uh, education is not um, addressing the needs of young people what specific characteristics of education should be available to them. There is of course a range of special educational provision available within Scotland I think we have to be satisfied and local authorities have to satisfy themselves by statute that they are best meeting the needs of every individual child by the decisions that they take um, in consultation with families. Um, as Lisbeth will know, we are looking at the whole area of the deployment of the mainstreaming principle and all of the issues that she raises are legitimate issues to be considered as part of that process. And I will, of course, keep Parliament updated about how those discussions with local authorities take their course. Question four, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment the Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills has made of an, of an initial and transferable skills strategy for meeting the net zero greenhouse gas emissions target. Minister Jamie Hepburn. We established the Just Transition Commission, which is the expertise in labour market and skills, to advise ministers on the move to a net zero economy. The Commission's work plan has identified skills as a key topic. Analysis of current and future labour re uh, requirements, including skills, will form an ongoing part of its considerations. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Minister for that answer, and he will be aware of um, Scottish Labour's position about uh, the, the thinking that this should be on a statutory footing. But I, I just highlight that um, often it is the North Sea industries that are looked at in terms of a just transition and to give two other examples, textiles, the opportunity to embed recycled materials into fashion and furnishing, and farming, for instance, the opportunity to embed agroforestry into the future are also issues. And can the minister update me possibly more in writing, if more appropriate, as to how assessments are being coordinated and the results maximized and shared um, in this climate and environment emergency? Minister. I am very happy to commit to writing to, to Ms Beamish in more detail, but I agree with the thrust of her question. We must make sure that in thinking about a transition to a, a net zero uh, carbon uh, economy, that it isn't just the energy sector itself that we must be thinking about, it's across all sectors. And in that regard, it's going to be very important that we're geared up to ensure that the entire population is flexible and able to upskill and reskill. Uh, so I agree very much with the sentiment, but yes, I'll be happy to write to her in more detail. Question five, Peter Chapman. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether multi-level teaching is the most effective way for pupils to learn. Cabinet Secretary. So, so multi-level teaching has long been part of Scottish education and teachers are well skilled to take account of the different needs of their pupils. We want to ensure that teachers are empowered to decide what is right in their individual settings. 
There will be varying levels of prior attainment in any class, and we have yet to see any firm evidence of educational disadvantage due to multi-level teaching. I am aware the issue of multi-level teaching has come up in the Education and Skills Committee's inquiry into subject choice. I will, of course, consider the conclusions of the committee on the range of issues it has been exploring when it reports in due course. Peter Chapman. At least 26 schools in the North East are running combined classes of three or more qualifications, including two out of the 11 Scottish schools running classes with four or more qualifications being taught at the same time. And in September, at the start of the school year, we were 140 teachers short in the North East. Can the Cabinet Secretary commit to giving the North East a fair deal and North East kids the best possible education? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm certainly devoted to making sure the children of the North East of Scotland, as I am to the children of the whole of Scotland, get a first-class education. Uh, Mr Chapman will know that there are some specific challenges in recruitment of teachers in the North East of Scotland, and that spreads across other public services as well uh, for all of the issues with which he will be familiar in the North East. I am pleased to say that we have um, a rising number of teachers teaching in Scottish education, uh, with teacher numbers at the highest level um, that they've been at since um, 2010. Um, so I, I'm determined to make sure that we have in place the resources and the approaches. It's why I've invested uh, to support the delivery, uh, the eSchool venture, which is designed to deliver um, flexible approaches to learning, uh, to meet the needs of young people where staff are not available in all circumstances. And I'm glad to see a number of mainland local authorities now using the eSchool, uh, which is a great uh, development from, um, from Western Isles Council, uh, and which is actively supported by the Scottish Government. May the fee briefly, please. Evidence given to the Education and Skills Committee from teachers noted that multi-level teaching is becoming commonplace. Every school represented had instances of it, with some commenting that teaching successfully in such circumstance is almost as impossible. If the Cabinet Secretary is right that this poses no disadvantage, these teachers must be wrong. Why are they? Cabinet Secretary. I think, I think the, the, if, I look, if we look at all the evidence that the Education and Skills Committee has taken, it's taken evidence from um, individuals such as Dr Alan Britton, uh, from the University of Glasgow, who told the committee on the 24th of April that when he was teaching in Scottish secondary schools in the 1990s, he was teaching multi-level teaching. So this has been a feature of Scottish education, and what, the, what I look to the inspectorate to do is to look at the quality and the effectiveness of teaching. Now, I cannot see in inspection reports an identification of particular problems or challenges that come with multi-level teaching. Now, obviously, we'll continue to look at inspection evidence on this question, but I do think we've got to acknowledge that there is, uh, this has been a characteristic of Scottish education for many years, and I don't think the educational evidence is marshalled that it is disadvantaging pupils, particularly because attainment is rising in Scottish schools. I want to get the last three questions in, so I want short supplementaries. Question six, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how it seeks to support reading opportunities for under fives across the Mary Hill and Springburn constituency. Minister Marie Torn. Under fives across Scotland will benefit from our transformational investment in early learning and childcare. Children in Mary Hill and Springburn are already benefiting from early phasing of the expanded offer. In addition, there are 11 equity and excellence leads currently working in the constituency. These uh, additional graduate professionals provide support to children in our most disadvantaged communities, including support with literacy. As well as that, we have the Bookbug programme, which delivers free sessions across Scotland, including in Springburn Library. And we've invested £7 million in the Play Talk Read campaign on the importance of playing, talking and reading with children in the early years. Bob Donnes. Uh, thank the Minister for that answer. And, and I know the, the Scottish Government has got a partnership with the Imagination Library, but so does Blocky and Housing Association. My constituency provide free reading books to all under five children every single month, direct to all resident children in the Blockier and Housing Association area. It's a fantastic scheme. Will the Minister meet myself, Blockier and Housing Association and the Imagination Library to hear how this successful partnership with Blockier and Housing Association has I been I think the Minister's got the message, Mr and, Doris. Well, no, the, no, 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 finally, don't try that on. I no, said short supplementary. Sit down, officer, please, sit down, sit down, sit down. Minister. Yes, I am aware of the Dolly Parton Imagination li Library on a personal basis. I'm a huge fan of her music, but actually her passion for reading and the work that she's done to improve literacy has been incredible and worldwide. 
The initiative was launched in Scotland in 2011 and the Scottish Government has been providing funding to date for this programme to operate nationally. In the last year, 33,451 books were provided to 2,309 looked after and adopted children aged 0 to 5 in Scotland. I am more than happy to meet the member to discuss that further if this would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Question 7, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking to ensure that Scottish students can access medical school places at Scottish universities. Minister Richard Lockhead. The Scottish Government is taking a number of measures to ensure Scottish students from across all sectors of society can access medical places. We are, for instance, funding 50 ring fence wedding access places focused on the 20% of most deprived wards and applicants from there. And we're also increasing numbers from 40 to 50 as of 2019 on our targeted pre-medical entry courses focused on social disadvantaged as well as remote and rural applicants. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. I've raised a case recently where a young person was offered a place as an international fee-paying student, but when his residency led, him, led to him being reclassified as a home student, the offer was withdrawn. Does the Minister agree with me that that is simply unacceptable and discriminates against my constituent? Minister. Well, as autonomous institutions, universities and colleges, of course, have responsibility for managing their own affairs. And this includes decisions made on the fee status of individual students. And institutions assess students based on criteria laid out in regulations and on evidence provided by the students themselves. As a result, on rare occasions, these decisions can vary from institution to institution. And clearly, in the case cited by Lewis MacDonald, the institution concerned has taken a particular uh, decision on who or who is not a home-based fee-paying student. Uh, therefore, I take it he has raised this issue with the institution. But of course, if he feels that there's anything I should do to investigate it, he should send me the details, and I'll do that. Question 8, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the criteria are for people applying to university who have leave to remain when assessing their home or overseas status? Minister. Well, as autonomous bodies, it's for universities themselves to determine the tuition fee status of students who apply for higher education courses in accordance with the Education Fees Scotland regulations of 2011. And eligibility for home rate fees is determined with reference to an applicant's residence rather than nationality or place of birth. I thank the Minister for that reply. I have a family in my constituency who came to this country in 2002 and have all leave to remain. Two of their children currently attend university and receive home fees. However, when their daughter applied for higher e education, certain universities and colleges classed her as an overseas student, meaning she would have to fee pay fees. Therefore, does the Minister not agree that the criteria should be applied equally over Scotland, all Scotland's higher institutions. Minister. Well, I think this question is similar to the, the previous question uh, as well. And I should reiterate, there are residency rules which are laid out in legislation and set out eligibility for tuition fee and living cost loan support. And as I also said before, we are speaking about autonomous institutions. And there are, however, rare occasions where these decisions do vary from institution to institution. So perhaps I could make a similar offer and ask Maureen Watt to send me more details about that particular case. If there is a case for my intervention to have more consistency across the institutions, I will certainly look at that very carefully. Thank you. And that concludes portfolio questions. I'll have a short pause before we move on to the next item of business.